many of our common activities in the past years that have given us opportunities to visit each other and, and work together as our <coughs> postgraduate joint symposium. This photo is from the first one. We made the second one in Hong Kong, and hopefully we'll have a third one next year. And that was with three different universities, and uh, you might recognize many of the faces in here from these activities. Now, the course has been going on for about five weeks, and we have had an amazing opportunity to interact with a lot of colleagues from all over the world, and also to attract a lot of attention up around our principles, which is comprehensive care with dental implants. Today, we are summing up the week five. So what we will discuss today is based on our philosophy of how implantation should be maintained, on how we strategize to prevent troubles in the long term, and also on uh, how we will design our maintenance protocols. So we will discuss our philosophy and then we will use the time to address some of the most common questions that have evolved through the discussions in the course throughout this uh, period of time. Now, my first part is about the biological components of maintaining patients, or if you prefer, the biological aspects of complications. I think maintenance and complications is exactly the same thing seen from two different perspectives. How to keep them free of complications is how successful maintenance should be. This is a textbook by Peringa Bronemark. It is one of the very first textbooks written about implant dentistry. It was uh, published in the early 80s, late 70s, and I discovered it in a library in the University of Queensland. It had some amazing uh, things to discuss. First of all, because you realize how much implant dentistry has evolved since the original pioneering times. Second, because at that time there were some important principles that I think on the go we actually got lost a little bit. What I like in this textbook is the title, Tissue integrated prosthesis. Beautifully said, tissue integrated. Unfortunately, in the years that followed after this publication, what took over in implant dentistry was not the title, but the subtitle, OSU integration. As you see, OSU integration in the years that followed was the synonym of implant dentistry. Many of the associations who were talking about implants, they actually named themselves OSU integration association. Suddenly, the focus of implant dentistry became osseointegration. integration. Get it to fit in the bone and you're done. And I think that was probably something that has misled us for many years. Today, we know that osseointegration integration is extremely predictable. We have <coughs> come to a point where 99% of the implants we place in the bone will osseointegrate. integrate. And actually, like Dr. Chachai says 100% of the badly placed implants will also integrate. So even higher success if you place it wrong. <laughs> so I think this is not really the case, but also integration was seen as the means of survival. <coughs> if you get it right on the bone and it also integrates, then there's nothing to worry about because as long as the implant stays in the bone, then you have survival and this, is, was, this was the main outcome of what people wanted to see, at least in the earlier days. This is a famous survival case. You might not be able to see the details of the x-ray, but if you look a little bit closer, you can spot that many of these survival parts are actually not surviving that well. This implant is swimming in a sea of inflammation, for example. So if you look at this from the point of view of implants in the mouth, everything is still in the mouth. And maybe the patient himself might not have noticed much trouble. But if you look at it the way we want to see it, to be healthy, to be functioning, aesthetic, and sustainable, then we are out of the concept. So today we're not into survival because this is how this survival looked like the day after the patient was discovered. So today we are into success. This survival means you're into deep trouble and you try to keep a low profile and say nothing and try to pretend you know what you're doing. This is not really what we're after. So today, success is the important message, and I think success will be defined not by also integration any longer, but by the tissue integration. How we have the complete integration of the whole tissue, that means bone, and the connective tissue, and the junctional epithelium, and the soft tissues, and everything around the implant 
is actually in a healthy balance. So OSI integration will succeed today very highly, but then soft tissue integration and whether we can achieve it and maintain it, this will be the major determinant of our long-term success from a great perspective. If we cannot maintain it, then this is where many of our troubles start. So success today has to have two very important parameters. First of all, we want success to be predictable. That means if I will do the same thing on the same patient with the same conditions and the same procedures and protocols, then I should be getting similar outcomes. And if I see it done by someone else and I follow their procedures and their protocols and I have the competence necessary for that, I should be also getting the same results. If something requires a master clinician and a master technician and a master lab and a very highly selected patient, it might be a proof of principle, but it's not what we would call a predictable procedure. Second, we want to have sustainable outcomes. That means you achieve really something beautiful, your patient walks out of your clinic and is happy, but unless you can keep this patient happy and your success for the long term, then you have not really done what is required today. And I think when it comes to implants, we are a little bit at the crossroads because we have 40 years of research and development and that's enough to know what works and what doesn't work. That's enough to establish protocols that give us very highly, very predictable success. But maybe because we see a lot of change, a lot of market pressure, a lot of different compromise coming in, today we see also a lot of problems. And many of the problems are actually due to compromise. Compromise of the protocols, compromise of the material, compromise of the procedures, compromise of the education and the training of the operator, and all of this might lead to increased trouble. And it doesn't take much to actually get in trouble. There is an interesting case study from Japan that was about four years ago. A few high profile complications were picked from the press. They were blown out of proportion in the daily newspapers. And suddenly the whole discipline of implant dentistry started to get a negative publicity. And once we start a vicious circle like that, there is no right or wrong then everyone will suffer. And uh, the whole implant dentistry treatments dropped significantly, almost by half, within a few months. And of course, many patients who would benefit from implants in the end ended up not receiving these treatments because they were hesitating, they were afraid, they were not trusting the implant and, and dentists. So I think we have to really engineer in our treatment philosophy how to maintain success and especially if you want to keep your practice sustainable for the long term in the same place. If you want to do like I do, that you move every four years to a different continent, I think most of the things will work. So success and how to define it. Let me use uh, an example given by one uh, PhD student in Sweden some years ago. As you see, this is in Swedish, but it's not really hard to understand. She is uh, reviewing zirconium oxide reconstructions on implants on the long term and trying to see success and survival parameters. So full ceramic bridges on implants. After three years, 100% of them were surviving. Very good result, you might see. But then if you want to see how many of these bridges were actually having no complications at all for the three years, this number dropped to 66%. And now this is a common figure, but this is a number per bridge. That means if you look at the bridges as one unit. What about the patient? Because the patient is the our unit. My patient doesn't want to know really the figures on the implant level. He wants to know how he or she will need to come for treatment afterwards. And if you look at the patient level, how many patients had to come back for treatment of a complication, that was almost 90%. So only 10% of the patients were free of unexpected trouble for the first three years. So very interesting way to look at it. If I want to sell you a ceramic bridge, most likely I will give you the first number. I'll tell you 100% in place after three years. But if I want to prevent you from using it, I can actually give you this number and tell you, oh, 90% failure at the patient level after three years. 
So you have to be really very much engineering your figures <coughs> to understand what is going on. And if we want to look at this at the implant level, especially with regards to uh, soft tissues outcomes, we can see, for example, that today also integration is very predictable. This is a number for single crowns and implants placed to support single crowns. And we can see that less than 2% failed to also integrate. Now, if we go to the five years, then the survival was 96%. And if we go to 10 years, the survival was 93%. So really high survival rate for implants placed for a single crown. Nevertheless, if you look at the success at five years, then this was dropping very much. It was to 61%. So already there, you discover that there is a discrepancy between what we call survival and the number of troubles that we see. And if you want to go to the patient level, this is very interesting because many studies, especially the ones that were done five years ago, will not report patient level, will only report implant level. Does it make a difference? I think it does make a difference. And this is one of uh, the newest studies about biological complications, about periplantitis on a very large sample of general population. And here we can see that the failure of ocean integration was 1.4 at the implant level, but 4.4 at the patient level. So almost <coughs> close to 5% of the patients will experience one implant loss, although only 1.4 of the implants will be lost. It's interesting because many patients, of course, will have many implants. So the more implants you have, the more likely you are to actually experience a loss of an implant. So when the patient asks me, how likely am I to have a failure or to lose the implant, which of the two figures will say? This is a little bit the interesting part. And of course, it depends on how you present it and how you want to manage it. Luckily, the difference is not that big here. Now, if you look at the nine year survival, out of this figure that also integrated. It was 98 at the implant, 95 at the patient level. And if you look at the severe to moderate perimplantitis at the patient level, it was 14% and 8% at the implant level. So luckily these numbers are not as bad as some studies have indicated in the past. I think we are getting to a manageable level. Nevertheless, you have to also think that this is very, very generic data. They come from thousands of patients and they're all pulled together. So it doesn't give you a decision-making ability because all these are about the average patient. Who is the average patient? Well, the average patient would look like this. Can you recognize this person? If you can recognize this, you have treated this, but I don't. This is uh, the average human as generated by blending some thousands of different photos of different people. So if you see this patient in your chair, then you know you're dealing with the average patient and you know that these numbers correspond to him. But in reality, we don't place average implants. We place implants in the aesthetic zone, implants in the posterior maxilla, implants in smokers, implants in patients with a diabetes, implants in patients with praxism or whatever. So in reality, our risk assessment has to be very individual because otherwise the generic figures will not be necessarily relevant. So moving on from the average patient and what we will be discussing today for the next few uh, minutes in here and maybe also in the second half, I would like to talk about the perimplant inflammations, the biological complication that can be created by plaque-induced inflammation. I will try to give it a comprehensive view. I will try to see it from many points of view, together with Dr. Chachai also interplay with the prosthetics and the restorative strategies. And then, of course, I want to sum up a little bit of what we know, what we don't know, and what is that we can actually do. So, when it comes to complications, traditionally, we have had a very black and white approach. We look at it from the place of origin, let's say. If it's a biological complication, comes from the tissue, comes from um, recession or inflammation, then we send it to the periodontist. If it comes from the screws, from the abutments, from the bolts or everything, then we say it's a technical one and we send it to the prosthodontist. And if you're a surgeon, you must be lucky because you usually will not see so much of the long-term complications. 
But this, I think, is a very artificial classification. It's because, as dentists, we love to divide things in black and white, to put it in boxes, to organize it in categories. In reality, and especially since I moved to Hong Kong, I have changed my view of the world. So I'm not so much into the very clear lines. I'm a little bit more into this interplay. What does this mean? It means that I don't think there is a pure biological or a pure technical expression. Sometimes the biological factors, together with the technical factors, they interplay to give us some trouble, which might manifest itself as a technical or biological. So in reality, I think most of the complications we think are very much connected to both biology, but also the technology we use. And I will spend some time to give you some examples on that. Now, let me just uh, give you an idea of how we came across this on a more scientific basis the first time. This is a study we did in Australia some years ago when we were trying to assess success and survival of implant reconstructions over the period of eight years. So we had approximately 200 patients and we went to all their implant supported reconstructions for eight years and tried to find out types of complications, number of complications, types of problems and, and all the tissue outcomes. We found a lot of things that we expected to find. And we also found some things we didn't expect to find. One of the first observations was that complications are actually clustered. What does this mean? This means that most of the complications occur to a small group of patients. So if you have a distribution of the complications being, for example, 30%, it doesn't mean that 30% of your patients will get actually an equal number of complications. It means that many patients will get no problem <coughs> and few patients will get a lot of problem. So essentially, if your patient comes with one complication, and that might be screw loosening, technical, or might be perimplantitis, biological, then this patient is at a higher risk to come for a second complication, either the same or of a different type not very democratic and not very fair, but that's how it works. So one complication is a risk factor for more complications, apparently. Second thing we observed was that those who had technical complications were actually three times more likely to have biological complications. So those who had loose screws, let's say, they were more likely to have perimplantitis. That doesn't mean that the loose screw will cause perimplantitis. It just tells us about the interplay that very often the loose screw and the perimplantitis might have a common denominator somewhere in our treatment plan, somewhere in our treatment design. And we saw many, many examples of this and we still see many examples of this that we cannot definitely identify what is the problem. For example, this patient was essentially sent to us for the treatment of perimplantitis. There was an abscess and suppuration and there was a lot of inflammation around the soft tissues. But when we look at it more carefully, you realize that actually there is a very technical foundation in the problem. You can see this gap here, and actually the gum or the soft tissues have opened the window exactly where this gum uh, uh, gap was and are screaming for help. So you cannot treat this biologically because although it manifested itself as a biological complication, in a sense, unless you can remove this gap, you cannot really treat the biological problem. And we'll see many examples of this in the next few uh, hours. So going a little bit more now to our theme for the day, at least from my point, which is inflammation. And perimplantitis is defined as a plaque-induced inflammation of the perimplant soft tissues. Many people will say, oh, but there is really a lot of debate about the definition of perimplantitis. No, I don't think there is a lot of controversy about the definition. The definition in my mind is very clear. is bacterial induced inflammation of the soft tissues around the implant. And that's very clear as a definition. The problem is not the definition itself. The problem is how exactly are we going to develop criteria to quantify it and diagnose it. And this is where the controversy starts. That some people will take radiographs and will measure bone loss. Some others will measure loss of attachment from let's say, wherever the baseline probing depth was. So depending on how sensitive you make your measurements, 
and how narrow you put this margin of bone loss, then this will influence how much of perimplantitis you diagnose or you don't diagnose in research studies. And this is an academic debate. I think maybe it's not really something we can solve today. But I think the definition is clear, and the definition has three important elements. First of all, we are dealing with inflammation of the soft tissues, and that's manifested in the classic way. Redness, swelling, bleeding, suppuration, the classical way that we would diagnose it everywhere else in the body. Second is bone loss, so we actually lose supporting <coughs> bone of the implant as a result of the inflammation. And the third one is that we're having an increasing proprium depth. And this is a little bit of a key to understand because it is not just like around teeth. We have not a threshold where we say more than three millimeters is perimplantitis, less than three millimeters is not. And we'll talk right about, straight about why is that so. So we do have a very clear connection here. We know that biofilm will cause inflammation and this inflammation will continue as perimplantitis. But what is also very important to understand is that through this very clear connection, there is a lot of other factors who are influencing the progress or the manifestation of the disease. And that can be factors from the host, it can be factors from the prosthesis itself, and factors from the biofilm or the environment. And all this can be broken down to even more and more parameters that we have to be in control. So in a sense, when we're talking about treating perimplant inflammations, Yes, it's the biofilm, but no, there is a lot of things we need to control before we can actually put everything under a healthy environment. So before I move on on how and when the inflammation will kick in, let me just remind you a few basic things that I think is a very important starting point from our understanding of the soft tissues <coughs> around implants. So let's look at this monster here. This is a tooth on the left side and an implant on the right side. And you can see the <coughs> schematic drawing of the periodontal versus the peri-implant tissues. And I think we all know that there are significant differences in terms of the structure. We have a very highly organized structure in the periodontal side with a lot of fibers and tissues actually being structured in a way to support the function. We have much better vascularization, and we have the collagen fibers being really aligned to serve a purpose, connecting the cementum with the bone, the cementum with the gingival margin, and the different elements of the periodontal uh, tissues. On the other side, on the implant level, we have a less structured organized tissue. We actually have um, less vascularization, we have a more fibrous component, a less cellular component, and a little bit more chaotic nature. We have fibers which are only organized around the implant like a rubber band. Now, some of the important similarities and differences here is, of course, the connective tissue zone underneath and then the junctional epithelium, which seems to be the same around teeth and implants. And this is what we have traditionally identified as biological width around teeth. So you know when you were preparing for a crown, you always wanted to leave space for the attachment of the biological width, which is the connective tissue and the junctional epithelium. And we also thought maybe uh, also the sulcus. However, the sulcus is a very, very big difference between teeth and implants. The sulcus around implants is not determined genetically, is not determined biologically, as it was, or we thought it was determined around the healthy teeth. So although we can have a sulcus of maybe half a millimeter to one millimeter around healthy teeth, when it comes to implants, the sulcus is determined pretty much from the anatomy of the local region and how we place our implants. And let me give you some examples on how we get to this. If you look at the original studies from the 90s, trying to identify the soft tissue height around teeth and implants, and this is a very classical one, you might come across some figures which look very similar. So if you look here, this is the implant side, this is the tooth side, it's three millimeters plus something. So that led people to believe that the height of the soft tissues around implants and teeth is very similar. 
But of course this works only in dogs. And if you have not seen how these sites looked like, then I can show you. This is a typical site of this type. Look at the anatomy. There is a very, very thick and wide bone, almost like a highway of bone, and there is very thin, soft tissues. Where could you find this anatomy in humans? Maybe some maxillary premolar, if you're very lucky. But this is probably the only time where the biological width around teeth and implants might be very similar. In reality, when we're dealing with humans, we have very diverse anatomy in different sites. And let's look, for example, our anterior placements. This is a typical anterior placement site, which today is quite deep in the soft tissues. Why? Because this is the only way that we can have it prosthetically driven. This is the only way that we can achieve all these aesthetic outcomes, this beautiful papilla height and, and the beautiful soft tissue emergence profile. So if you want to make it look aesthetic and nice, you have to place it deep under the tissues and then you create this site. Now, the actual attachment is only the first couple of millimeters down there at the bottom. This is the connective tissue and the junctional epithelium. And what is on top of that? On top of that is just salvus. So this is actually no attached to the implant surface or to the abutment surface. This is purely epithelial salcus, and it can go as deep as maybe four or five millimeters sometimes, because that's how we place the implants today. So if we look at it a little bit more schematic, this will be our crown with a beautiful emergence profile. And if you look at it from the mesial and distal side, then you are dealing with a soft tissue attachment zone, which is maybe a couple of millimeters down here, and then with a very deep salcus, mesial and distal, over there. And actually this is not only in the aesthetic zone, sometimes when you move towards the, the posterior maxilla, for example, you have thicker soft tissues, and you can also have this effect there. You can have some sort of a tuberosity and then really a deep sulcus placed in this level. So we create actually deep sulcus and the soft tissue height is not determined by biology anymore, it's determined by our placement and our technology. And when I was trained as a periodontist in Sweden many years ago, I was led to believe that everything that is deeper than three millimeter is pathology. And I was trained to eliminate pockets. I was trained if I have a six millimeter pocket to do everything I can, including surgery, to eliminate it because I thought that this was a point of trouble and pathology. And now today, placing implants, I find myself creating these five millimeter pockets around my implants on a daily basis. Is this a problem? Well, I think it's not. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. And I think there is a big difference between the six millimeter periodontal pocket and the five millimeter sulcus around an anterior implant. And what is the difference? Well, the difference is that we have created the sulcus overnight in a non-infected site, while the periodontal pocket was developed over many, many years from the apical migration of the biofilm, the pathogenic biofilm. So if I'm allowed to just show you a little bit more on my thinking here, I just have to find the right point. What, uh, what happens in periodontal disease is that the biofilm is migrating from the coronal position to a more apical position. So it is not generated at the depth of the bottom. And this is why the, the pocket is not done overnight. It actually takes many years. While what we're doing here is we're creating a salcus which is free of biofilm. So the key is to keep the salcus free of biofilm. And how do you keep the salcus? You prevent the biofilm from migrating from coronal position down to the salcus. So if you look at the normal anatomy of the natural teeth, they have a scalloping, mesial and distal following the bone, which means that also the soft tissues will follow the scalloping. If we place an implant, we eliminate this. We have a flat profile, mesial, distal, buccal, and lingual, which means that whatever we create as a salcus will also be much deeper on these sites. And how deep this will be, we can see it 
immediately this is a tooth side and you can see the floss is actually penetrating no longer than maybe a couple of millimeters in between the sulcus of the tooth. If we want to do the same with the implant, we want to take our dental floss and push it all the way to the bottom of the implant sulcus, this will be actually much more. Look here how deeper is the sulcus around this anterior implant. Now, do we need to, to put this floss so deep? Do we instruct our patients to do that? No, I do not do that and I don't think it's necessary. I don't think that the patient will have to do that. Because in reality, I'm not interested about the bottom of this sulcus. I'm interested about the first couple of millimeters. The biofilm is not starting from the bottom. It starts from the top. So if you keep the top clean, it will not grow down and then your sulcus will not be infected. And I think this is the important thing. It's not bacteria hiding in the depth of the pocket. It's biofilm very, very slowly migrating downwards. And if you don't allow the biofilm to form, then you will free of the problem. And you can see this apparently very frequently in uh, the profiles of the soft tissues. This is what we want to see. We want to see beautifully keratinized or epithelialized sulcus, which is free of inflammation. And this is a sulcus that can stay free of inflammation as long as we keep clean the first couple of millimeters. So down here is the attachment. The rest is the sulcus. And my battlefield, my actual zone of trouble, will be just this danger zone here, the first couple of millimeters. So if your emergence profile allows cleaning, and if your patient keeps this pile point clean, then you will not really allow any migration of biofilm and any further inflammation of the perimplant tissues. So that's where we have to work today. If you don't, on the other hand, then this is how the problem starts. And let me just show you a couple of cases to illustrate this. This is a denture that has a lot of trouble. I'm not going to discuss much in detail. What I want to point out is the emergence profile. You can't really see it very clearly because of the contrast, but apparently there is no way that this patient can clean around these implants. They're sitting on top of the gums. They're blocking everything around it. So when we remove this, there is no surprise of what we see. There is inflammation of the soft tissues around this implants and of course this is the uncleanable areas now can you see a little bit my point of interest is this particular implant here this is one implant that cannot be cleaned but can you spot a little bit how the placement of the implant can predispose to trouble look where the tooth is this is where the tooth margin is this is the buccal surface of the incisor and look where the implant is so if you place an implant so much palatally and you place a, a tooth so far packally, then you create this dead space here which is impossible to clean for the patient. So this is a recipe for trouble. And either you have to place the implant closer to the prosthetic position, or maybe you should not place an implant there. I think with a full arch reconstruction you do have a lot of flexibility. Or maybe you can find some other ways. But Predisposing now this position is very difficult for the patient to clean and there is no surprise that an inflammation will come. My favorite spot is down here. You can see three implants here. Actually, you can't see three implants. You can see maybe one and a half. This is the first implant. This is the second implant. And there is one buried under the denture at the bottom there. So what do you think we will see when we remove this denture now? Again, no surprise. The first implant seems to be in healthy tissues. Second implant has a mucositis. Third implant has already advanced perimplantitis. So keeping this emergence profile clean is, I think, the key to prevent the trouble furthermore. And if you see a patient that looks like this, and this is the emergence profile now after some months with a temporary, and he cannot obviously clean effectively around these implants, then probably the worst thing to do is to place the permanent reconstruction and send him home. I think we have to make sure that he will be able to clean efficiently before we do anything else. And look, the papilla is already splitting here before of the inflammation. 
and here you can spot this. We, we just spent so much time talking about aesthetics and papilla and how you get one millimeter or two millimeters or three millimeters, and then we don't realize that it's all pointless unless the patient will be very efficient in cleaning, then your beautiful papilla will have a very, very short life expectancy. Now, if you see things like that, then you can easily guess that this will be a recipe for trouble. You have to make it from this side to this side. And the key is to control the cleaning of this emergence profile. This is the reason for the trouble. So if you see this, you can connect it immediately with this non-clean, full of biofilm reconstruction. While if you see something like that, which is a clean and smooth and well-maintained, then you can expect to see a sulcus like this. So I think when it comes to this emergence profile, I think that will be the key and our main battlefield for preventing peri-implant inflammation in the future. And this is where we can have the most significant influence for the long-term survival and success of the reconstruction by designing a reconstruction that is friendly to the tissues and by making the patient motivated to understand how important it is to keep it clean. Then, when it comes to the height of the soft tissues, I think today we have to accept that we cannot do aesthetics unless we have very high soft tissues. We cannot really achieve the natural looking crowns unless we can live with a very deep sulcus. So we have to maybe accept the fact that some sulcus around the implant will be five millimeters but then try to keep it as low as necessary, only in the aesthetic zone, and make sure that it stays clean. And with that, I think I have made the most important link I consider between the biology and the technology. And I would like to pass straight away to Dr. Chachai to continue with his point of view and his aspects from the technical side. And then we will have an hour in the end where we can actually bring everything together and hopefully come up with some recommendations and strategies that address both the biological and the technical side. Thank you.